Well, one a day is Thursday, March 30th. How'd that happen? <laughs> it's amazing how fast time flies. And this is the week and charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. So we're going to talk about this should be 2023 for starters. Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. In fact, a lot of this show is current market conditions. Your questions on trading uh, for your, your individual stock picks, uh, hold off on those and crypto picks. Hold off the, on those until we get to the live charts. If you don't mind, just that's for your benefit so I can see what I've covered and what I have. And along those lines, also for your benefit, ask about one at a time and then hit carriage return. All right, good news or better news? I woke up thinking about this. I'm like, I always wake up thinking, what do I do a show on? Well, of course, I ask you guys what you want. And if you watch it on YouTube, leave a comment. I'll take a look at it and, and see if I can I do something there. And by the way, if you do want to watch these live or 10 live and bring your stock questions, stock picks, trading questions, money management, psychology, et cetera, go to daylearner.com slash webinar. So anyway, I woke up thinking about signs and signals of a bottom, just some recent events that happened, nothing earth shattering, but there are a few things that are have been occurring lately that have me thinking that we're getting closer to a bottom. That was a flame screen, as you know, you could lose money trading, or is all the summing up, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's jump right into it. Signs and signals of a market bottom. Now, let's just back up a little bit, and as I often say, friends and relatives, they all, contact me freaking out when the market's down about 30% or more. None of them check in with me when things are going well. And I figured in 20, I didn't realize it was 2021. I thought it was last, I keep saying last August. In 2021, on August 25th, I went to YouTube and I looked over to the stock charts. My channel is at Dave Landry. And then stock charts has their own channel. I do a show for them too. And as I just mentioned, I was on that final bar or mentioned right before we went live. Anyway, so I said, you know, as long as the market's making new highs, now would be a good time to get in front of it and do a show on market timing. And then that way, all my friends and all my relatives can watch it because they know what I do. And I wouldn't have to start answering my phone like around now, especially when the market's banging out new lows down 30 or 40 percent on what they should do and it's like well the reason i called it before the bomb blows up it's like the bomb is already blown up and all it could possibly do then is add insult to injury if you don't get out the market could go down 50 percent because they asked me well what's the worst could happen i'm like well the market goes down could go down 50 percent or more and you'll you know market lose half its value and it might take 25 years to come back and it's like they kind of like one friend who i'm going to pick on now <laughs> He turned white when I said that. Anyway, so crickets, crickets, crickets. And even as the markets begin to drop, still crickets from all my peeps. And I used to work out with a guy and he hurt his, his shoulder. And ironically, I hurt my shoulder, which tells me we might have been doing something wrong <laughs> at a friend's house who lives just around the corner. And when I got a signal for the TFM 10% system, which I'll walk you through this in just a few minutes for those of you who are not familiar. And I have plenty of YouTubes on it too. So if you go to add Dave Landry once you're on YouTube, you can pick up some of these. But anyway, I said, uh, you might want to talk to your guy. And he goes, I did. I said, well, what did he say? He says, he says we're getting more aggressive now that the market is lower. Now, I'm pretty bad about keeping my, or What's a good way of, of phrasing this? I wear my feelings on my sleeve. I'm a very emotional guy. I cry like a like a girl if I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie. I watched uh, Coda the other night, CODA, I think was the name of it, Cry Like a School Girl. And if I watch like a Formula One race documentary, <laughs> spoiler alert, they usually end badly with these uh, great people like Cena, and what's the other one? Cena's competition. I love those. I love those shows. Those guys are just maniacs. Anyway, I'll cry like a schoolgirl. So it's just yesterday I walked in the in the house and my wife's like, What's wrong? I'm like, nothing. She's like, You are a liar. <laughs> so I didn't even realize it, but I must have rolled my eyes. 
And that's when he kind of um, he got kind of puffed his chest out a little bit. He's like, "What's the worst going to happen?" And I'm like, "Well, you can lose half of your money or more, and it might take 25 years to come back." And he turned white when I said that, like I just said. Anyway, so that was that's what tends to happen. Nobody tends to care or talk to me when things are going well, and even when things are going not so well. But once things get really ugly. All of a sudden, people seek me out, and my phone begins to ring. And that's why, again, I did that presentation. That's two years ago before the bomb blows up. But anyway, I'm getting cornered at cocktail parties and kids' birthday parties. And I got to thinking, it's like, I really don't go to that many kids' birthday parties, but if there are cocktails being served, I might be inclined to go. We, we did our penance over the years with our two daughters. And now we avoid them at all costs. But now that we're in a subdivision, we do get invited around a little bit. And I know who's who, and I know who might have beer. So <laughs> I'll at least pop my head in. And the last one, a couple of weeks ago, I sort of got cornered a little bit. And you know, one guy's like, what's going on with the economy? And then have the rates topped? And is, is it the administration's fault? They were looking for a fault in the bear market. And there'll be plenty of blame to go around, I'm sure, after all is said and done. How much lower will stocks go? What's going on with the banks? And in general, as I was going live, I was thinking like the man in the street somehow knows what I do. I work out now in a public gym. I've always been a member, but I started working at this guy's house and I would just fill in at the public gym. And now I'm just at the public gym all the time, just down the road. And, uh, you know, some guys that I really didn't even know knew what I did. They're like, uh, How's the market doing? You know, I'm like, oh, okay. So I found that kind of interesting. So now, and I'm sure I'll say this in a few minutes. You can't time off of off of empirical uh, observations or whatever like this, but I think it is a bit of a sign. And it was kind of easy last weekend or week before, whenever it was, having the instructions for trading printed on my arms, how to read a market. And I was trying to explain to him that it's not that the economy doesn't matter or the bank failures and so on and so forth. It just matters what the market does. It mat The reaction is what matters. And that's what you do as a trend follower, you follow along. I've been re-listening to Jesse Livermore's book, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. I forget the pen name. He he wrote it under Lafair or something. Lafair, some kind of uh, French name. But anyway, he talks, it's amazing how he talks so much about the technicals of the market, what they are doing, okay? So fundamentals and news and a lot of things that I'm going to mention that I'm getting asked about tonight might suggest what the market should be doing, but the technicals suggest what they are doing. And that's another thing I'm working on. And I know Greg has done a lot of writing and investing, I don't think I have within reach, investing with the trend. He talks a lot about this too. And it's funny because I wrote it all out and then I reread Greg's book. And it's like, oh, this does sound a lot familiar. <laughs> but it's like all these people come to all these different conclusions about what they should do, but they end up voting in the overall market, kind of along the lines of something that G.C. Selden said. It's like the, the stock market is kind of a, a gauge of how everyone is voting. They're voting with their money. Everyone doesn't get an equal vote, obviously. Those with more money get more votes, so to speak. Anyway, a little technical analysis, apologetics kind of slipped in to the presentation here. And that's something else I'm working on too. And that was a chapter I'm working on in the book. Now, the other thing, it's starting to wear people down. And I'm one of those people. And it's like, like I said, I walked in the house kind of bummed out. I'm just sick of this shit, you know? <laughs> And uh, this morning, I put out a post, as I normally do on Thursday mornings, like, okay, what do you guys want me to talk about tonight? And this is the Facebook group. The Facebook group is free, but you do have to be at least a gold member of DaveLander.com or a member of my trading service, which includes gold. And I'll put some links down below and post for that. I think everybody here is in the group, but for those who are not, some links on how to join. And we've got some really good traders in here. And Geo said, will the pullback scans ever show setups again? And uh, I'm just reading this for the first time here with how you know they will. Yes, they will. In fact, the market broke out a little bit today, and, and we're going to flesh that out in a lot more details when we get to the live market analysis. 
But yeah, they will. And right now you're not seeing any pullbacks on the long side because the market is at new highs. The market would have to do what? Pull back or some individual issues would have to pull back. And he said he hasn't seen any for about a year. And I like what Jim said. He said, even the best setups are risky in bear markets. Some will make a few bucks, most will not. Cash has been king for over a year. This may be changing, new bull or sideways churn. Lots of sideways churn. Maybe we have a new bull developing. I don't want to commit too much to it just yet, but if I start seeing setups, I'm going to start taking them. And I'll, flip, I'll walk through a few of those areas in just a second. If you pay your money, you take your chance. Me, I took a long runner break, but I'm easing back in. And then I went on to say, it's like, from now I'm a spoke, spokesman and expert. I went to sit on his hands. Jim Freeman will answer any questions about choppy markets. Let me reread re that. From now on, my spokesman and expert on when to sit on his hands, Jim Freeman, will answer any questions about choppy markets. Now, I do agree 100% with Jim said. The only thing is, it's okay to take a break, but you need to continue to do your homework, or as I often shamelessly plug myself, pay me to do it for you, because, and I know I say this quite often, but you never know when that next big winner is going to come along, and I don't want to point out any individual stocks because it's gonna, it might hurt some feelings, but I see it happen all the time. I see people just get ground down and then they quit. And then that same day, sometimes, I'll have one or two of the biggest winners of the, of the year trigger. And that's the downside of trend following. And that's one thing that I need to flesh out a little bit more and actually do some presentations on. There's a, there's a lot of negatives about trend following but trend following is the only way to make money trading. You have to capture a trend. You have to sell higher than you buy. Duh, duh, implied. And I just went on to say, we did have a short setup tonight. There were some energy shorts tonight. Uh, if you're on a trading service, if you don't mind, do me a favor. Just take a look at the the, the thumbnail and, or I'm sorry, you actually, yeah, you should be able to see it on the thumbnail. Take a look at what's on the Landry list and let's stay off of those if you don't mind for tonight. Um, and I'm not too excited about it. Kind of, uh, kind of backs up to what Jim says. Yeah, there's been some setups, but they haven't been fantastic. And, and we, they've been few and far between. And I have been taking a few here and there. Right now we're along MBLY, and we're slightly underwater. We've been on both sides of the market with it. We were underwater yesterday. No, I'm sorry. We were, yeah, we were, we were slightly underwater yesterday, slightly underwater today. But it's been kind of all over the place. So he's right. The setups really haven't worked out that great, but you do have to keep chipping away at it. You do have to do your homework. But as I say, you do have to be super selective. And I found, I went back by accident, I found an old presentation where I went 52 days from trigger to trigger. And then the last day we had a setup trigger, I think was on March 6th. So that's what, how many days is that? It's my brain is kind of tired right now, 14 days. So it's been at least a couple of weeks before we've actually had an actual setup in, in one trigger. And hopefully, I know you should never say hope, hopefully don't, we won't go 52 days. But if that's what the system calls for and that's what the core methodology calls for, then and so be it. But yeah, it's starting to wear everybody down and I'm part of that present company. And I've been showing this slide quite a bit and I showed it in my Trading Simplified show. But as I often preach, you always wanna look at the net-net price change. And this could be like, if you're looking at a setup, and a lot of times people say, hey, Dave, what do you think about this pullback? And I'll be like, well, it's going completely sideways for a month. I got a squeaky board. It's going to sound like I'm tooting in here. <laughs> isn't, it weird? isn't it weird? You can make a weird noise and you can't make it again. Hopefully the mic's not picking that up. Anyway, uh, longer term, we've gone about a year of sideways. And I've been showing electrocardiograms in here too. And it just it's just hard to catch a trend because there is none. You can't catch a tan. When the sun's not shining, you can't catch a trend when there is none. But it's really starting to wear everyone down. And then eventually, once everybody gets worn down trying to fight it out, then what happens? The market begins to trend again. Now, I did want to show what happened a while back. I remember I was at a cocktail party, and it was right after the stocks have crashed in, in 2000. And I don't remember exactly when it was, but I know the market had gone down significantly and bounced a little bit. And one of the guys there said, I am done with stocks. And he was fed up. 
you know, literally throwing his hands in the air. And he says, I'm putting all my money into real estate. I thought to myself, I don't want to get into any details there. Get thrown out the party. It was at his house. <laughs> but I'm thinking like, okay, uh, you know, when you're fed up with one asset, it's not necessarily the best time to jump into another. But he did really, really, really well at real estate. But unfortunately, as I was kind of thinking to myself, that'll work until it don't if if you don't understand market cycles and market timing. And they were really getting into real estate like on a crazy basis. And his wife sort of ran the real estate business and she got a lot of her friends involved. And that was in the crazy times of late 2006, early 2007. And watch the big short if you want a feeling on how that was. And I lived that. You know, my wife is kind of on a tangent to the real estate business. She's a notary. And uh, we would go hang out with these people who were in a title business. And they were just making money hand over fist. And they were partying like rock stars. And they would invite us along for the ride. And she was a salesman, so she had to go along. And I was along for the ride. It was a lot of fun for a while. They were like on permanent spring break is what I called it. But anyway, unfortunately, all good things come to an end. I'm not being shot on Friday because it happens. And believe me, I've I've gotten killed before in market downturns, but now I know. And I remember after they got all their friends involved and they thought, um, you know, I got to watch what I say, I guess. But I guess they kind of thought these people were real estate, these um, geniuses, because they were making so much money on the real estate. And then, of course the market imploded and ended up dumping the real estate. By the way, the big short, great, great show to watch. Watch it alone if you understand markets, as everybody here does, obviously, or anybody watching this. Because if you watch it with someone else, you know, I have a bad habit of thinking that this person does not understand what they're seeing. I better explain it to them. <laughs> because if you don't, if, if you're with someone that doesn't understand the markets, it's like they're not going to get the show. But if you understand markets, it's it's crazy. And I remember, you know, it's like the, he was at one point, not the spoiler, spoiler for you, but at one point, uh, Steve Carell's character was talking to a stripper and uh, he was paying her for her time so he could just talk to her. And he said something about uh, her condo or something. She said, which one? So she was a stripper and she was caught up in the real estate market and, and buying all this real estate up. Anyway, that's a that's a whole other story. I want to digress too far, but a great movie. I really enjoyed it. Now, getting back to signs and signals, it takes time. It takes either price or time or both for a market to bottom out. Now, I'm not saying you wait X amount of weeks and then jump back into the market. What I am saying is it takes time, and we've been in this bear market for over a year, for about 66 weeks since we made the new closing high. This is 10% less the 52-week closing high. This is a weekly chart, S&P 500 cash. And the whole TFM system is when it closes below this line and closes below the 50-week moving average, which is not in this chart, obviously, you sell. And that's to get out the way. Because if a market's going to drop 50%, it's going to drop 10% first. I am not saying you won't get whipsaw with this system, but I am saying you will exit before a bear market, provided, of course, the market doesn't implode more than 10% when it hits the 10% number. Knock on wood, so far throughout history, the market has not dropped more than 10% from its highs before doing some consolidating. And if you go in and look at 1987, it would have been hard to actually follow it, but you got a sell signal the day before the market crashed. I can't guarantee you it'll always work, but you go all the way back to the depression, same sort of thing. In the 70s, times were abysmal. I had a few times in the 70s it triggered. Now, I've only had it public for five, for about five years, probably, I'm guessing. So maybe it won't do so well in the future, but so far, I think it's behaving as I intended. And the whole intention is not to try to beat the pants off the market, but to not let the market beat you. And that's what market timing is all about, by the way. Market timing is not so much about beating the market. It's about not letting the market beat you. 
And the only reason that market timing works is because you occasionally have a bear market in between. And the more bear markets you have, the better it works. So the TFM 10% system on the S&P 500 sort of did okay beating the S&P over maybe 20 years or so. But then you go back 100 years and you factor in the Depression and the 70s and all these other horrible times in the markets. Then I think it beats the market by like a factor of five. If the market goes straight up for two or three years, okay, maybe you get a whipsaw or two with this system, then buy and hold is going to beat the pants off of it, okay? But sometimes in those whipsaws, and I know I'm digressing, but hear me out. Sometimes in those whipsaws, like the pandemic, the market dropped about 30% after the signal, if memory serves. And it's hard to live through that 30% drop. One of my friends was staying with us right around that time, and he was as white as a ghost. And he wasn't sleeping at night because the markets were stressing him out. So thank God it came back. I don't know what he ended up doing. It's one of those after the bomb blows up type of things. He probably bailed at the lows. I had another uh, friend, I, more of a, I guess a relative, that uh, put all the money in like right before the pandemic hit. And they, he, she told the guy she wanted to be conservative. So he put her in bonds and gold and stocks, like big cap stocks and fundamental funds. And I've showed the presentation before and all those things tanked. It, it, a lot of them harder than the market. So just remember, if you decide you don't want to time your real estate or time your stock purchases or time your gold purchases or any other asset on the planet, all assets will lose 50% of their value or half of their value at some point in your lifetime. And I've seen two or three 50% haircuts in stocks. I know I've seen a 30%, I've seen a 75% haircut in the in the NASDAQ and a similar move in the Qs. And that's why, as I'll show you in one second, the TFM system actually works in the Qs. To my surprise, I thought it would be a little bit I didn't think it would work in its, in its present form because of the Qs are more volatile than the S&P 500. But the reason it works is because the Qs lost 75% of the value at one point, and then a couple other times, uh, or at least one or two other times, half of their value. But anyway, long story endless, it's been 66 weeks since we had a new closing high in the S&P 500. Now, in addition to that, not that I would say if a market drops X percent by it, I was at a presentation once and the presenter was saying, hey, when a market drops 50 percent, you should buy it. Well, that'll work until it don't. Warren Buffett, who supposedly does all this very simple stuff. Oh, I like cheeseburgers and cherry Coke. You know, kind of reminds me of diabetes. But. He sold a shit ton of puts when the market was down 50%. Now, maybe he did the math and, and the implied volatilities were so high, but what's to keep those implies from going higher? And what's to keep the market from, from imploding further? So he looked like a genius doing that. But to me, that's certainly not a value play. And that's certainly a risky thing to do. And the aforementioned gentleman was talking about doing something very similar, selling puts and all. It's like he was talking about the strategy after the market bottomed out. It was down 50%. And I'm thinking to myself, that'll work until it don't. And and it's like it took everything in me not to not to stop him. But it was in Italy and I didn't want to look like a look like an idiot. Anyway, so it's not that if a market drops 30%, or 40%, or 50%, that's enough. But it does help us for as the bear market process goes. The lower the market goes, the more people get pushed out of the market, especially if you have a longer term bear market like we're in now, where prices go low and they stay there for a while and you have a lot of false moves in between. It kind of wears everyone down. And like I said, in a stock chart show, eventually, I think what you'll see is a tightening of the range. And then you're going to see a breakout one way or the other as the bulls and bears begin to come together. Where's one of the bulls and bears? My wife, whenever, oh, here's a coyote. Whenever we travel, she 
or if she sees him, she picks me up a little bull and bear. But anyway, you get the idea. No, oh, here's the nope, that's a coyote. Never mind. Anyway, so 66 weeks, 27% and counting. Now, obviously, one thing I woke up thinking about too, and everybody at the party, the last party I went to, and then the man in the street lately. They're all asking me about the doom and gloom, you know, what's going on with the banks and uh, they're going to make it and wh where are rates going? What the hell is the Fed doing? When's the Fed going to stop? And you think we'll get another quarter point, three quarters point? And it's like, you know, I don't know. And I show my arm and try to explain what I do. But a bear market is not going to bottom on good news, okay? There's not going to be an economic report that's going to look great and and happy days are here again. It's more likely going to bottom on bad news. And right now we've got war, we've got inflation, we got a Fed that's jacking rates, banks are failing, and I'm kind of shocked so far. It, it, again, you have to, as I preach, you have to believe in what you see and not in what you believe, but I'm shocked that we're not seeing more ripples through the financial system with this bank tanking thing. So that's that's a bit of a shocker there. But there's plenty of bad news to go around now. And uh, what's the old saying? When there's blood in the streets, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets. Don't go buy just because there's blood in the streets. But that's, um, that's along those lines of the bottoming process. What's it? Uh, sell when the bands are playing and or something like that. And then buy when there's blood in the streets. Well, certainly blood in the streets. It's kind of like the pandemic. You know, we all thought we were going to die. What did the market do? It, it's sort of going up again. Now, as mentioned earlier, I think I mentioned earlier, we do have a buy signal in the, in the queues for the TFM 10% system. And just by accident, I, I plotted it the other day. Or I might have been messing around when I forget. But I was surprised that it looked like it worked pretty well without any tweaking whatsoever. And as I said earlier, maybe widen out the parameters either said earlier in this show or in the final bar either one but check out the final bar later tonight it should be on youtube tonight or go to stock charts tv stockcharts.com and then click on the little tv thing but anyway the reason i put tfm signals is i'm wondering if it works in other markets other than the s p 500 and it certainly seems to work in the queues and I'll throw a spreadsheet up in post to show you my testing there. By the way, I don't really do a lot of programming testing anymore. I used to program like crazy. Now most of my testing is done by hand. I think that's a better way of doing it. To really, It really gives you a feel for what happens. I mean, could you really have written out these drawdowns and could you really have taken uh, multiple signals and so on and so forth? But anyway, getting back to the system, the buy signals are a little bit more stringent. Sell signals, Again, you just have to have a close below the 50-week moving average, and it also has to close below the buy line. So as soon as you're close the week, okay, 10% or more away from the 52-week, 50-week, not 52, 50-week closing. I kept them 50-50 to keep the math easy or to keep it easy so you can remember. 50, this is 10% less the 50-week high. And this is the 50 simple moving average, simple weekly moving average. Anyway, close below both of those will begin X. And you can see the diaper change in this from here way down to here. I didn't measure it. I don't, I mean, I, it'll be measured in a spreadsheet, but that's a pretty substantial diaper change. Just eyeballing it, that's but about 30% or more. And that's the whole idea with the system is to get you out of the market when the shit begins to hit the fan. And as I preach each week, once bad things start to happen, then more bad things tend to happen. Bad prices tend to beget more selling, or, or as bad things happen, it begets more bad price action. That's why trend following, not all the time, but quite often can work. But anyway, buy rules, a little bit more stringent. You need two bars of Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average, and you must close above the buy line. Now, George was asking, Yesterday, would the buy be at 315? Well, technically, the buy could be anywhere from, let's say, 295 on up. And that's provided, of course, that we don't touch this moving average. But any, any close tomorrow 
provided we don't, again, touch the moving average at all, any close above 295 would be a bias signal. But I like the way George thinks by saying, is 315 a bias signal? Because that would mean that this week is higher than last week. As I've shown before, I've had weeks where it sets up, let's just imagine that these two bars were above, way up here somewhere above the buy line in the 52 week, 50 week moving average. But notice that it sold off hard. So I'm tempted to add that rule that it also has to be a positive week or a positive week from the first week of Landry Light. But I don't want to complicate matters. I want to leave the system in its purest form and see what happens. And then in your own trading, if you are following something like this as one of your longer term market timing signals, then by all means, make sure you have the strength before you go in and buy. So if we tank really hard tomorrow, which we might be due to do, believe it or not. I'm not talking about both sides of my mouth. I'm going to show you something here in just one second. Then I would say it would be no bueno on that buy signal. Wait for at least a week over week higher close. Today's close must be higher. Friday's close, I should say, needs to be higher than the prior Friday's close before buying. And I think that'd probably be a good little rule to add in. Now, I'm guessing that TFM system, 10% system is, is triggering in some areas because a lot of areas are improving and not the last week at Bandcamp, but one of my charts I showed on the final bar today was the SMH, the semiconductors. And you can see we've had mostly green Landry light and this little indicator down here, I just like to call it I like to call it an illustrator because it doesn't indicate anything. It just tells you what's happening in the chart. So you can look at the charts and see. But it can be quite useful for scanning. And it can also be useful for kind of waking you up to what's going on. But always look at the chart. But notice that we've been mostly green for a while. And this is a daily chart. This is a 30 EMA. I like using the 30 EMA on a daily. And one of my patterns is a Landry Light pullback where you get the Landry Light, lows greater than moving average for 10 bars or 20 bars. 20 bars for a more established trend, five or 10 bars if you're trying to play like a transition. And I've covered that before, so just go to YouTube and then look for at Dave Landry for more on that. Anyway, you can see, and I'll give you some other links too where you can get the, the systems and patterns. But you can see Landry Light, and then when it comes down, it crosses the moving average, the Landry Light goes to zero. So it's just counting the number of bars, not the magnitude or distance or anything like that. Notice that. The price is closing in on a moving average, but this continues to rise because it's just, again, counting the number of bars. And we came down and we had zero downside Landry light, meaning that no highs were less than moving average. So this market was still strong, even though, or certainly not weak, even though it wasn't making new highs, okay? So you can see you did have some upside Landry light in here mixed in. In any market, as long as you're mostly green, you want to be long. If you're mostly red, you want to be short. And if it's flipping back and forth, like it has been, especially like on a weekly S&P, then you want to be mostly sitting on your hands. Now, XLK, it was a toss up today where I was going to show XLK or the semis. I'm just a big fan of the semis to confirm what's going on in the market or to just gauge the health of the market in general. Not that I'm going to rush out and buy stocks overall because the semis are strong. But I do think it can be, I don't know if a harbinger could be a good thing, but it can be a harbinger of good things to come if that's if I'm using that word properly. But you can see the XLK looks even better than the semis. You can see it's broken away from its moving average. So pullbacks here could be worth playing. And whatever it represents, mostly big cap tech, I think. And that would be worth a shot. Big cap tech has been doing pretty good if you bought some of the major household names. Your apples, I think Tesla in general has been doing well. And we can look at any chart you want in just one second. So that's doing pretty good. You can see lots of Landry Light for quite some time there. And like the semiconductors, it, it did lose steam, but it did never, it did never, it never did get below the moving average. At least the highs didn't take off. Yeah, that's that's I didn't have time to put that chart in here. I figured we'd just cover it live. That is one of the kind of the, the flies in the ointment, so to say, is the rusty. The rusty is just not doing so hot right now. Sure, like to take off. 
Resty's a little bit more indicative of smaller cap. Something like XLK is going to be bigger cap, and obviously technology in this case. So not everything. The market's not firing on all eight cylinders, and it's probably better that it's not as it gets going here, because otherwise it'll just you know if it, everything just goes all at once, it, it's tough. Because I've been preaching this to my people in the service. Because you you get long and you, and you make a decent amount of money, but it's kind of like a one and done situation. Then it becomes like a now what? But if we get these rolling sort of takeoffs, like if Sibis take off and big cap tech takes off, maybe some value stocks take off for a while and become momentum stocks as they can do after a bear market. And you know maybe the energies begin to roll over. You get this nice little sector rotation. Then you could play that for a long, long time. But yeah, I'm a huge fan of uh, keeping an eye on the semis with the overall market. Now, as Brian just alluded to, there's always something to worry about. One thing I was noticing tonight, or earlier today, I should say, is that the VIX is getting stretched away from its 10-day moving average. And the volatility was really coming into the market. You can see the moving average was rising and the VIX was around the mid 20s and now it's beginning to back off and now we're below 20 on the VIX. Now the absolute level doesn't matter, it's the relative level relative from the research I found to the 10 day simple moving average as I've said a thousand times. When I work with Larry Connors, Larry was really into the VIX and that's when I was doing some hardcore programming and system testing. And he explained to me how the VIX works and he said, yeah, it just uh, it tends to revert back to its mean. And none of Larry's systems had moving averages in it. And I said, well, the mean is the moving average. Why not just take him literally? And then that's where my VIX systems came from. Now, just real quick and go in and watch the other videos that I've done on the VIX, again, on YouTube or my website, DaveLeonard.com. And especially if you're a member, you'll have, uh, I have everything kind of laid out for you on the website. But anyway, if you're following this as a short-term system, it, it will print money as I preach. But it's one of those things like all short-term trading, all pure short-term trading, it's that'll work until it don't. So what'll happen is you'll do really, really well in something like this, and then you'll start getting buy signals right into a pandemic or something. And that's when it gets that's when it gets a little hairy, it gets a little nasty, and you lose, you give up months, if not years, of profits. One thing I've been noodling with though, and tomorrow I might keep an eye out just in case, even though I'm starting to get a little bullish, as you can tell, not super bullish, but a little bullish. I'm always cautious. But tomorrow I might short the market on an intraday basis. If I see the market begin to tank a little bit, I might go long the VIX if I see the VIX begin to rise. But in the back of my mind, I'm beginning to get a little bullish and that's gonna kind of go, the trader in me is gonna to want to short tomorrow. And the longer term, bigger picture guy in me is wanting to go long soon. So how's that for talking out of both sides of my mouth? <laughs> so again, we're stretched on the VIX. We're at about 14% round numbers. Now keep in mind, again, this is relative. So the market may readjust. So what'll happen is if that, that moving average is coming down really fast to meet the VIX, so maybe we'll get a little bounce in the VIX, maybe we get a little sell-off in stocks, and it'll normalize at a little bit lower level. For a while there, the volatility was getting kind of crazy with the VIX up in the mid-20s. And I've done complete presentations on the VIX, and just don't operate heavy machinery after you watch those. I stole that from Greg Morris. He wasn't talking about me. He was taking the piss out of himself. All right, uh, let's shift gears and go into crypto. Obviously, I'll talk about the, the big pairs, but if there's any any individual crypto you want to look at, I'd be happy to do do that for you. The crazy thing about crypto, as I've been saying at nauseam, is it goes from 19, excuse me, 1999 to 2000 overnight, and then it goes back to 1999. <laughs> so it's a bit crazy. Let me see if I can get the application shared here. Here we go. So let me clean this up a little. So taking a look at crypto, let's take a look at Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin, lots and lots and lots of Landry light. So that's a good thing, but it is kind of stuck in this little bit of a consolidation here. I'd like to see it make some new highs and not look back. One thing I was looking at earlier for the final bar, it's like if you're looking at the 230 EMA system, you'd had a buy signal back here somewhere. And then one, two, a buy would have been here, but it never would have triggered, which is pretty cool. And I know I'm a nerd, but that's pretty cool. Even though it's a breakout system, it does have a bit of an anti-whipsaw characteristic to it, which is really cool. And it goes back to that Landry light. I know you want to party with me. That Landry light is pretty cool shit, if I say so myself. Anyway, one thing I was looking at, too, is bar one, bar two, that would have been your sell signal. Give it a little wiggle room so it would have been below the slow. Now, it came roaring back, but maybe with a little money management, if you were following that 230 EMA system, then, uh, and it, I think I have that in the YouTube shorts on my YouTube channel, if you want to check that out. And I'll have a link below to my channel and all that other good stuff if you're watching this on YouTube. But anyway, this thing really imploded. So with a little money management, I mean, that's what, a couple of thousand points, a couple thousand dollars drop. That's pretty significant, I think. So the other buy signal would have been above this high here, so somewhere in here somewhere. And it's doing okay from that from that signal, a couple thousand bucks so far. Not that you want to rush out and trade that mechanically, but something like a 230 EMA or TFM 10% system in stocks can, and can be a keyword in that sense, it's helped keep you on the right side of the market. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum doesn't look as good as Bitcoin. Let's go over to the rest of the shiz coins. S-H-Y-T, shit coins. I'll be calling them shiz coins. Not quite as vulgar, right? Let's see if I have Ethereum or Bitcoin Ethereum in here. Let's see that. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So, like I said, Bitcoin obviously doing better than Ethereum. And you could really see it if you look at Ethereum versus Bitcoin, okay? So Ethereum was outperforming here, you know, bar one, bar two, entry would have been here. Nope. Bar one, bar two, short Ethereum and go long Bitcoin and stay short until at least you intersect the moving average or use some money management, trailing stops, et cetera. Right now, again, you know, we keep flipping back and forth from 1999 to 2000. There are a few in here taking off last week and then. Weeks prior, I got asked about volume. And if you're just playing a relative strength game and you're looking at the strongest ones, you see these long tails in here. This looks like a very low volume pair. So I would not take this, even though it's strong. Let's see if there's something in here that's breaking out to new highs, looking good. A lot of those uh, HI ones are I mean, all these things are bogus, right? <laughs> but those are like really bogus. Like, it's like pictures of digital pictures of cats that change with the moon phase. It's like, even I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. Like, this looks kind of interesting. Might be something that I would look into a little bit. Coin web it does look like it could be thin at times, but it looks like it's beginning to take off. Sometimes, especially when they're all moving, as I've said a thousand times, you could just jump on these things. And like a case like this, I'd use a 20% profit target and then uh, give my stop to break even if I get that 20% out. I'm only long one right now, it's at CFX. And uh, I'm in the money on that. See, that looks like something that would have caught my eye, but it does have some long tails in it. But I'd like to see more and more of these things take off. And a lot of these things are just bouncing from lows. So there's really nothing to do with crypto, but hey, check check get check back with me tomorrow. Maybe there is something, and if I see something tomorrow, just for fun, I'll uh, I'll throw it out in um, in Facebook for you guys to take a look at. All right, let's shift gears and take a look at the overall market. And if you guys want to ask about individual stocks, I know I've kind of talked quite a bit about the market so far. So there's a few things I want to go just show you some of these other sectors in here. Uh, let's just start with the P's and go through a few, and then we'll we'll get to the rusty, and uh, I'll show you what Brian was saying. So we did close above the 50 and the 200 simple. Nothing magical about those. In fact, I rarely use these unless I think they're relevant. And right now, I think they're relevant. 
because they're well watched and it's important to pay attention to something like that that's well watched as far as moving averages are concerned i'm not really concerned about all these other indicators out there but as far as a moving average i do like moving averages anyway but you can see we're still stuck in this sideways chop but at least we're looking a little bit better now as i preach one or two days one way or the other can make all the difference in the world if we drop significantly tomorrow and monday or whenever that would put us back to the 200 day moving average and would really be in the soup but right now s&ps are improving not fantastic but okay Let's take a look at the dollar. Dollar came up to kiss that 200-day moving average goodbye, okay? And then it rolled right back over. So I find that kind of interesting. Dollar down seems to be good for stocks, at least now. It's also good for commodities because the cheaper the dollar is, because commodities are dollar denominated, the cheaper the dollar is, the more dollars it's going to take to buy the commodities. Do read Intermarket Technical Analysis. I think John Murphy is the only person that's done a complete book on that. Just know that it only matters when it matters. Early in my career, it was a godsend. I worked for a, a hedge fund, and we would take a look at what the S&P was doing. And uh, actually, I was a lead technician, so I did that. And it would help me to figure out where bonds were headed, and it was it was really cool. But then there was a decoupling to where it only worked when it worked. So that was a bit of a bummer. But in the markets, you have to be willing to accept these changing relationships. But learn how intermarket technical analysis works. Don't rush out and trade just off of it. I was in some form years ago, and I was showing bow ties or something for e-minis or whatever the case may be. And some guy chimes in, all you got to do is watch the dollar. If it's down, you buy stocks. If it's up, you sell stocks. I'm like, Okay, that that's not a concrete <laughs> rule, but you know, from your microscopic observation over a short period of time, you are 100% correct. But that'll work until it don't. At least as a system in and of itself. Now, as a composite, you see nice little Landry light beginning to break away from that 50 simple. That's a good thing, obviously. On a net net basis, multi-week, nearly multi-month closing high in here, and not too far away from this high over here. So that's looking better. S&P looking better. NASDAQ looking really good. Simmies, as you saw earlier, looking really good. But what's the rub? The rusty. The rusty just bleh, looks bad, okay? Down below the 200-day moving average, down way down below the 50 simple moving average, okay? Maybe it's a complex head and shoulders bottom, but that might take another six months or a year to work its way out if you're trying to look at that bigger picture technical analysis. You know, if you read some of these books of bigger picture technical analysis, they might show you a weekly chart that goes on for five years and it just looks so obvious. Like, oh, yeah, okay, I, I see that head and shoulders bottom. It's pretty obvious. Well, it took five years to form, <laughs> you know. So be careful with that kind of stuff. But it does look a little cleaner on a weekly. Speaking of head and shoulders, you have a complex head and shoulders bottom. Uh, this would be, I guess, a shoulder here. The bottom is down here that it has two heads so but again don't trade directly off of bigger picture technical analysis do learn how to use it to kind of put some wind in your sails the wind at your back i should say energies are kind of interesting in here they look like they were the mother of all rollovers but now they're pushing into this overhead supply i would not rush out and buy energies i have a couple that i'm showing tonight actually a handful i'm showing tonight as potential shorts other than a day trade which i think i said earlier in Facebook, I might do a gamma play on some options, some put options on two of the ones that I mentioned tonight. But other than that, that's kind of like S&G trading. I'm not going to rush out and go crazy short on energies, but if you had to short something, energies look like they'd be a pretty good trade. I almost said bet, but a pretty good trade. Drugs are kind of interesting. They look like they rolled over. They found support at 200. And now they're going straight back up through this overhead supply. So that's kind of interesting. By the way, as I often say, I doubt the energies will lead us out of this bear market, and to a lesser extent, I doubt drugs will, but who knows, right? And the reason is the old leaders, notice how energies were pretty strong for a long time. The old leaders rarely become the new leaders in a bear market, after a bear market, I should say. It's interesting, listening to reminiscences of stock operate, a lot of those things are coming up again that it's taken me years to learn. It's like, but I just listened to the book and read the book, 
then it would make sense. Yeah, tech's doing well, George. Banks look dubious at best. Let's keep an eye on this low right here. If that gets taken out, there's no support for long, long ways. I do feel like I need to short them as a trader, as a person with a with a brain and emotions. I, I'm a little nervous about shorting them just because of, uh, and I hate to confuse the issue with facts, but God knows what kind of bailouts are going to be thrown at these guys. But I tell you this, not that you want to confuse the issue with facts, but if the bailouts get thrown at them and it doesn't do anything, then short with both fists or just short with one fist because it's very dangerous sometimes. One thing I've been kind of shocked at is I've been using the analogy of throwing the pebble in the pond with the banks, thinking that it would ripple through the system, but it really hasn't destroyed some areas like you think it would, such as financials. Now, financials don't look fantastic. Don't get me wrong, probably have a bow tie to the downside let's just see yeah bow tie proper order to the downside not that you want to trade that but they're certainly not doing fantastic right but they're they're doing better than you would think they would do given the situation and the bank's insurance would be another area you would think would be doing much worse than it is although looks like a top is in place here lots of support below though for insurance all right just a couple more areas and then uh if there's any stocks you guys want to talk about George, is that a stock you want to look at, or is that just tech in general? Hardware, aka Apple. Let's just pull up Apple. I think Apple's the most of hardware. Yeah, it looks a lot like hardware. Apple at new highs in here. So these big tech names, yeah, tech in general doing okay. These old school tech, the video was one. You know, uh, that's looking pretty good. And I was asked at the final bar today, and I only had like, a, you know, in one minute. <laughs> Does a stock like NVIDIA scare you? It's like, ah, I don't have enough time to go through the details. But like I said two weeks ago in answering George's question, sometimes these stronger stocks can be a source of funds. However, the semiconductors are sort of leading us out of this bear market, at least so far. So I would give stronger stocks within the semis a pass as far as that concern about source of funds. Go in and watch the last couple of presentations on source of funds just to stop. Uh, so your eyes won't glaze over. Here's retail, it's all over the place, but at least, at the least, it's going sideways for a long, long time. All right, Rick wants to know about AVGO. I think that's enough market analysis. We looked at the semis a minute ago, they're doing okay. Uh, AVGO, yeah, that looks kind of interesting. The I'm not a huge fan uh, when these stocks are bumping up against their old highs like this. And since we're kind of trying to come out of a bear market, I would prefer if stocks were coming off of lower levels. Maybe an exception again to that kind of unwritten rule would be the semiconductors. So I would pass on this one just because it's bumping up against its old highs. SMCI. Yeah, George, good eye on this one. This one looks pretty good. Um, I would I would personally pass just because it's a little wide and loose, even though. I can't argue with the fact that it's made its way higher. One thing that's kind of jumping out at me, it's like it needs a little bit more pullback, but then again, if it pulled back any further, we'd be back into this base. So all this, whatever you want to call it, mental masturbation in my head, at first glance, I would say, oh, this looks good. And it's like, no, it don't. No, it don't. No, it doesn't <laughs> um, because of that. But it, it's one of those not bad. Like I, I couldn't really fault someone for taking this but I could tell you why I wouldn't take it, okay? So not a hard no, but a hard no for me personally. Okay, any more? All right, going once, going twice. Quite a bunch tonight. I guess we we talked too much all day huh? <laughs> at Facebook. All right, uh, while we're in impasse, I wanna thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time. I need busy schedule. In spite of me forgetting to put a show up and everything else, we're we're making new records as far as number of people. Not nearly as much as we used to have, so I need to work a little harder on that. My apologies. I promise if you go down below to the links or if you just go to daveline.com slash webinar, you will be signed up for the shows and I will add the shows in as I do new shows. And you sign up for one, you should be signed up for all. George, Christopher, Brian, all the rest of you guys, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Everybody and Jeff, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again, I'll see all you guys 
and girls tomorrow on Facebook. Thank you so much.